Zana ends up meeting a guy named Hetton, a nobleman who has Umbaran assassins with him. I don't exactly remember the circumstances, but it was on her mission to... Where did she go? She went to... Sereno? Yeah. No. No. Not Sereno. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, it was Sereno. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. She was at Sereno. She met the Hedden guy, which it's kind of funny since Sereno, I believe, is Count Dooku's homeworld, I think. Let me just check real quick, because I want to be sure that I'm, I'm right about that. If not, then I'm an idiot. <laughs> yeah, Count Dooku's home planet, Sereno, yeah. Either way, she returns to where Bane is. I'm not exactly sure where, because God, it's been a while. And with Hetton and the Umbarans, because she's going to set them on each other and see whoever wins. And I don't know, use Hetton if he lived, or maybe take him under her wing. I'm not exactly sure, but Bane kills all the Umbaran uh, assassins off and Hetton, because he's in a freaking rage, and the Orbalists make him pretty much impossible to kill. He goes after Xana in his blind rage. She manages not to die because she plays off that she was using Hetton and he knew that he would kill Hetton um, because then she could she found out the information of how to get to Tython which if you all know what Tython is basically well you know what Tython is if you don't know Tython is a world in the deep core where the Jedi Order was founded after the Force Wars from the original Jedi Order, which was this strange, weird amalgamation of light and dark philosophies, which, quite frankly, feels like it was really forced together more than anything. But either way, it's like the birthplace of the modern-day Jedi Order and kind of the birth birthplace of the origination of Sith philosophy, but it's a whole nother story. Um... Because Bane has been looking for a way to create his own holocron because he wants to save his own information, his own knowledge, and his own essence to be learned from and used in the future by future generations of Sith. But he can't make one because, well, he just doesn't know how. But he knows that it's possible considering that Revan and Freed and Nad had a holocron, each respectively. And on Tython, in the fortress of Bilia Darzu, Bilia Darzu, Bilia Darzu, whatever, uh, supposedly the information of how to make one would be there. Uh, because she was an ancient, well, somewhat ancient Sith alchemist who created a lot of techno beasts, which. Techno beasts are this horrid creature thing basically used, created by Sith alchemy of fusing flesh with machinery and the machinery kind of grows it's messed up it's as messed up as it's a form of sith spawn um it's a messed up version of it kind of like robo zombies almost um of course it's like robo zombies so basically what happens is Bane goes to Tython and he goes to Darzu's fortress where he fights a whole army of techno beasts and he manages to fight to, to win he beats them off and he beats them off Jesus Christ <laughs> oh I got a mind of a five year old okay he defeats the army of techno beasts oh and he sends Xana to the Jedi temple on Coruscant because he wants to Research, he wants her to research ways to maybe remove the Orbalisks because he thinks that the Orbalisks could be holding him back after years of having them attached to his body, of course. Um, she goes. She's discovered by her cousin, who I didn't mention at all, Duravit, who was on Rusan. Or no, I did mention him briefly, but he was on Rusan. She met with him after she joined with Bane. Um... Basically, she forced him away because she's a Sith now and she couldn't, like, be with him or associated with him. And I think she, like, cut off his hand or something and left him there to basically die, essentially. And Bane was just kind of like, okay, well, whatever. Leave him there.
but he didn't die. He went with the Jedi, and uh, he finds her in the library trying to find the information for Bane. Um, he reveals to the Jedi that the Sith exist and Zana's one of them, and basically they go to Tython. The Jedi follow after, which I believe one of them is, Far is Farfalla, the guy who reinforced um, Lord Hoth on Rusan years ago. Raska Raska Su, Saro Zaj, and Waror Domat. Holy fuck! Where did you come up with these names? Okay. Yeah, four Jedi, and I believe, I think it's Saro Zaj, uh, I'm not sure. One of them is a really huge son of a bitch who gives Bane a lot of trouble. Oh yeah, Saro Zaj, that was him. Um, anyway, so... Bane and Zana end up dueling all four of them on, in, eh, on Tython. Zana killed Rastkazu and Zaj. Bane killed Farfalla and fatally wounded Domat. Um, what? Oh no, there was another Jedi. Never mind, there were five Jedi? Holy shit. See, this is... The kind of little details I keep forgetting about. Just how many Jedi went to go and kill Bane and he and Zana managed to murder. So, Jedi Othone Orth... Othune? Orthune? Othune? I don't know. Uh, Bane is going to go kill him and he uses Force Lightning on him, but he creates a Force Bubble of protection around him. And it sends his own... It sends Bane's Lightning right back onto him and it fries the Orbalisks. Him and the Orbalisks. And so it's quite obvious that, well, lightning can kill them, apparently, because, well, just like with the Vong, lightning is kind of a an active but kind of passive power where, yeah, sure, you're generating lightning with the Force, but it's still just an elemental power. It can affect anything, really. Which is why maybe the Jedi should have used it more in the Vong, but whatever. Um, and when they did, the Vong were scared shitless. <laughs> Um, and it fries the orbalisks, orbalisks, god dang. And when they die, they send a poison through Bane that threatens to kill him, because, you know, why wouldn't they? Zana kills the Jedi Master, Othun. She takes Bane to her ship, takes fucking Derovit with her. They go to Ambria, because she remembers Caleb. And, um... Caleb only heals Bane after Zana, I think, promises to turn Bane over and like give up being a Sith. But when Bane wakes up, uh, he Zana tells him what she did, and he's disappointed, and he's like, "Oh God, just kill me now, because it's, it's all over." But Zana, but when the Jedi arrive, they find Caleb dead, I believe, and Darovid's insane with a lightsaber. And they think he's the Sith, like a Sith Lord or a Sith Apprentice or something, and they kill him. They're like, "Oh, that takes care of that." And they leave. Basically, Zana drove her cousin crazy, and he thought he was like a Sith, or he was just nuts and attacked everybody. And Caleb was dead, so the Jedi were stupid and like, "Well, that's taken care of." Um, and Zana actually smuggled Bane and her off world and. That's essentially where book two ends with Bane being kind of like, oh, didn't know you had it in you. P pretty good. Ah, so that's where book two ends. Jesus. See, that took a lot shorter. What the hell? Why did I spend so much on book one? Oh, God. Okay, so book three. Really quickly, I'm going to gloss this one over because, like I said, I barely remember three. Just the, the, the footnotes, you know? Basically... Bane creates his own holocron, but now he's worried about Zana because she hasn't yet attempted to kill him in all the years that they've been around. Um, he's taught her a lot. She's pretty strong, but he doesn't think she has the the drive to take over, to, to kill him, basically, and complete the, the circle of Rule of Two. 
And so he begins looking for ways to either extend his life or become immortal, which I always felt kind of go, goes against his whole his whole mantra at, in the first place to have one master, one apprentice, because it feels like Bane now just kind of became another Sith who just wants to be immortal for power's sake, kind of like Palpatine, where it's like, well, I'm already the most powerful, well, why should I have another apprentice? Why can't I just live forever and just do it that way? And he basically... I get that he had a... He was like, okay, I'm worried that the Sith are going to die off because my apprentice isn't like... doesn't have the drive. But it felt a little like... Now you're just becoming another Valkorian because he... Of course, no one knew who Valkorian was back then, but you know what I mean. Um... He try he goes to Prakith after he finds from a Sith uh artifact dealer, which I don't know why the Republic would allow a Sith artifact dealer to even run in the galaxy, but whatever. He gets a lot of uh info, he gets artifacts and stuff from of the Sith from him, and he finds out that on Prakith, um there's a temple dedicated to or a temple or just a place where the Cult of Malevolence have the holocron of Darth Endeddu, Endeddu, however the fuck you say his name. And he goes there, he kills the Cult of Malevolence, and he takes the holocron, which supposedly uh, has the information of Darth Endeddu and how he lived for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And it won't tell him, because, for reasons... But because Bane now has the information on how to work holocrons, he forces his own mind into the holocron. He takes the information on how to do essence transfer, which is basically what Vitiate slash Valkorian did to stay immortal. Base, immortal lights, not really immortal, just, up oh, this body's dead, I'll go into another one now, type thing. He sent Zana off to, to go discover what had killed the Jedi a couple of years ago on some random planet. I'm not exactly sure what happened. Um, I don't remember that part all too well. But basically, Bane comes back to their mansion residence on Seatric 4. I think. Seatric? One of the Seatrix of the hegemony. And he's once again fucking attacked by a bunch of assassins and he kills a couple, but there's Nikachi force sensitive there. She stabs him with a blade that has some sort of neurotoxin that knocks him out, and he's taken to Doan, where there's a princess, of course, named Sarah, who begins torturing him because she's the daughter of Caleb all the way back from book one, but she wasn't there for book two because... I don't know, she went from living on a hut and on Ambria to becoming a princess? I don't know how it worked. It just, it just does, apparently. So she's torturing him. Bane and, um, insists he didn't kill Caleb because, well, he didn't. Um, but he mocks her and says Caleb was weak and yada 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 yada. You know. You know the drill. Um, she knocks him out with more of the neurotoxin and she wants to keep torturing him. But her own bodyguard is actually Lucia from book one who was Bane's fellow Gloomwalker, like I said before. She frees Bane because she feels she owes him from back in the war, and her mistress, the princess, is kind of being nuts at this point. So Bane escapes, he kills a bunch of people in the prison. Um, he senses Zana is tracked him down and is coming to Doan, but she's actually coming there to kill him because she found out about Darth and Dendu and thinks he's gonna he wants to live forever and which is like totally not the point of the rule of two as she was taught by him and so she wants to kill him now because well she wants to actually preserve the rule of two i i know people are going to argue that bane wants to preserve the rule of two but he's kind of not by wanting to become essentially immortal he are you going to tell me that he just wants to be live for another couple decades and another another body to teach a Sith how to become more powerful than him, yet he could just transfer into that body or another body at his own whim. It doesn't make any sense. It, it's basically he wants to become immortal. That's kind of the point of power with the Sith. Um, 
He runs into Lucia. She begs him not to kill Sarah, I believe. I don't know why she's protecting him, really. Um, he is going to attack her, saying that, well, the soldier he knew is not alive anymore. Or the soldier she knew, I think. Or something like that. Um, he hesitated for a moment, though. Just for one moment. Um, as all Sith do, except for Valkorian, because Valkorian is the devil. Um, uh, but then Xana arrives, kills her, saving Bane from having to do it. And she wants to kill him because she thinks he wants to live forever and that he won't pass on his knowledge. And he says she's not ready. And so she attacks him, but he doesn't have a lightsaber. And see, this is where Valkorian is bullshit. Slash Vitiate. Because this is Darth Bane, one of the most powerful, intelligent, strong Sith Lords that ever was. And he manages to hold off Zana with the Force, but he knows that he can't really win against her without his own lightsaber, and that he's only delaying the inevitable. But he has... But basically... Okay, so, just quickly. The prison's alarms start going off. Sarah activated self-destruct bunch of wall and rock comes crumbling down and it makes a wall between uh, Bane and Zana so they go their own ways to try and escape from the prison but here's the thing Bane using the force to hold off Zana from killing him but him knowing the inevitable was coming that she would eventually kill him is a lot more interesting than just having a scene of Valkorian standing there holding up his hand while his son tries to kill him with a lightsaber and just being like, nah, man, I have, I'm so freaking powerful in the forest, lightsabers can't even touch me. This is, like, really dumb. Like, you're, you're lame, bro. You can't even pass my shields. Like, do you even shield, bro? It's just... Oh, God. Valkorian is so stupidly overpowered. That's why Bane is an interesting character and fucking Valkorian slash Vigiant is not. Anyway, Bane goes to a hangar. He sees the Akachi from earlier. He's going to kill her, but she bows to him, hands him his lightsaber, and basically she wants to join up with him. Um, and she wants to become his apprentice, realizing that he can use the Force, how powerful he is, and she wants to become a Sith. Bane is interested, and he's like, okay, well, you know, my first apprentice apparently didn't work, even though, well, she did. And they get on the ship. Um, they go to Ambria again, and he find Bane finds Sarah, who's somehow able to escape the destruction of the prison. Um, look, I don't understand where this storyline with this Sarah chick even comes from. I don't know how she goes from living on a fucking hut with her dad on Ambria to being a princess. I don't understand how the explosion of the, the prison doesn't make her a princess anymore and she goes back to Ambria and she's just there and her desire for revenge is gone and she tries to convince Bane and the Akachi to turn away from the dark side and they kill her. It's just like what? What the fuck kind of life did this lady have to where, okay, little girl, she's in the living in a hut. Woman, she's a princess. Okay, her prison blew up, so now she's gonna go back to Ambria? What? Why? Is she not a princess anymore? Does she not have a palace somewhere, or guards, or a, a people, or a husband, or a prince, or something? I don't... What? It doesn't make... It, it doesn't make sense to me, that's all I'm saying. Okay, so the Akachi gets renamed Darth Cognis and becomes his apprentice, but then Zana arrives on Ambria, and those two are going to duel, and Cognis just stays out of the way, deciding whoever wins is going to be her new master. Um, I believe it's a her. Yeah, it's a her. Um, Bane and Zana duel, and it's a pretty intense duel, they're, you know, both very powerful, whatever. I'm not very interested in Zana, to be honest. But Bane, um, 
beats her back with the lightsaber, but she unleashes some Sith sorcery. He manages to fight him off, but she plays the trump card of her Sith, like, tendril things that just form out of nothing. And if you touched by them, you experience unimaginable pain. And if one, like, really gets you, like, on the arm, as it does with Bane, it just vaporizes it. Um... So Bane's arm is vaporized, he's in intense pain, he manages to stay conscious, and so he unleashes his uh, essence transfer attack on Zana because, you know, he's going to take over her body now. I don't know why you want to, but whatever. <sighs> um, so they have, like, an internal, like, force struggle to see who has stronger will to take over the body. And at the end of the day, Bane loses. Zana had the stronger will and Bane is essentially f thrown into the great void which is just Star Wars equivalent of hell because whenever a Sith dies they go to the void even though they can be called back I'm using air quotes from the void as Frieden Nad was so it's it's essentially Star Wars hell I'm just I'm being honest here okay um but if the essence transfer wasn't a complete failure, there's like a, a small bit of Bane's personality that made it through to Zana. So she has like a constant like twitch of her hand that Bane used to have. She constantly like she like flexes it. And that's what Bane used to do, so it's kinda of like a tick. She got one of his ticks. And she takes Cogniz as her apprentice because, well, she proved that she could stab Bane in the back and knock him out. Why not? And so that's how Darth Bane, creator of the Rule of Two, died. Holy fuck. That was a lot harder than I thought it would be. Okay, let's try and finish this up. Um, I don't think I need to really express how significant Darth Bane is as a character in Star Wars Legends, at least. Consider, and considering that Without him, Palpatine would never have risen to power. Vader would never have been a thing. You know, if you really think about it, the Sith Ari, which Darth Bane was, which was the Bane... Ugh, the Bane. The Sith that would break the foundations of the Sith to make them stronger, which he did. If you really think about it, the Sith Ari was the reason for the Chosen One even existing. Because... Whether or not you like the fact the Chosen One thing's a prophecy or not, it is part of the canon and it's part of Legends. Get over it. Um, but being serious now, without Bane, there would have been no Palpatine. Without Palpatine, there would not be a Vader. At least not as we know it. And without Vader, there would not be a, you know, a fall, a redemption, and then a balancing of the Force. And then enter his grandson, who's a wee baby. But anyway, I digress. The thing about Bane is that not only was he... Okay, first of all, let me just mention that, yes, of course, he was a... As stated in the book, or books, several times, Bane was a freaking master with lightsaber combat. Once again, as to the specifics of his uh, styles and whatnot, I'm not exactly sure. Um, most people seem to think it was Jem So, since he was such a, you know, a brutish, kind of overbearing, kind of lightsaber duelist like Anakin Skywalker was. Which, you know, makes sense, considering his physique and how he was overbearing and just straight on onslaught with his lightsaber. Makes sense to me. Um, but I'm sure, just like with all those really powerful Sith Lords, he had at least a very <sighs> introductory, at the very least, knowledge of all the seven forms of lightsaber combat. And I'm sure he was masterful on several of them, not just Genso. Um, he was strong with his Force abilities, obviously. I mean, he could deflect sorcery with his mind. He could unleash powerful blasts of forest lightning. He could help... He, first of all, he knew the technique for creating the, the thought bomb. Of course, he wasn't stupid enough to use it himself. He created a force wave powerful enough to set the entire forest on fire. He could 
easily pass off Lord Khan's mind trick ability, which, to give Lord Khan some credit, he was stated to be a very powerful force user in his own right. So for Bane to just kind of go, okay, yeah, I'll play along, but this really isn't going to make me have a mind trick moment. That's, you know, a pretty powerful feat. Um, resilient son of a bitch, considering he's been poisoned, stabbed, beaten <laughs> several dozen times, I'm sure, in his life. And he always picked himself up. Of course, you know, he had help several times, especially, like, from Caleb. This fucking weird ass fucking situation with Caleb and his daughter. I am not even, his the whole situation with this kid just really gets to me. Like, okay, I don't know what this lady's life story is, but I don't know if I want to know. Um, uh, if someone wants to remind me how the hell she ended up a princess and then decided for whatever fuck reason to go back to Ambria and become a seeming monk out of nowhere. Go ahead and leave it in the comment section because I'm not about to read up on her life story. It it boggles my mind, but I'm not that interested in it. Um, you know, and the thing about Bane, too, is that he's a lot more clear-cut and, like, obviously important as a Sith Lord. Okay, yeah, you could say... Exar Kun was important for the Sith to continue. Revan was important for the Sith to continue. Um, Naga Sadao, Marco Ragnos, even Vichiet, Vichiet, whatever. But Bane has a very clear and obvious significance, considering that without him, the rule of two would never have been established. The Sith were in total disarray under Lord Khan and the Brotherhood of Darkness, because as I have stated the way at the beginning of this video, the Brotherhood of Darkness was a bastardization of the Sith philosophy as a whole and basically turned into a dark Jedi club more than actually Sith Order. And Darth Bane coming along and basically beginning a Sith Reformation was what was needed to keep the very basic fundamentals of what it meant to be Sith alive. I mean, there have been several characters in Star Wars who have broken Sith foundations or remade them because they were broken in the first place. Like, the Sith Empire under Naga Sadao was pretty clear-cut and knew what it was, and then the continuation under Vichyet kind of just continued that same line of thinking and process. You could argue Exar Kun kind of remade the Sith, but the Brotherhood of the Sith was... As much as I may like Exar Kun, it's not exactly clear how that order exactly worked. Revan was probably more important in remaking the Sith from the dysfunctional foundations of Exar Kun. I mean, he did build off Exar Kun's foundations. That has been stated several times that some characters, some ideas, some thoughts from the Great Sith War actually carried over into Revan's empire. So Revan kind of built on that clumsy foundation of Exar Kun's and turned it into his empire, which kind of was the formula into the Sith Triumvirate. But that whole order was completely wiped out, which led to the resurgent empire under Bichiet and Valkorovich. Um, yes, that's, those are the names. I don't care what you say. And then we get all the way up to Darth Ruin, who was a much more important character because the Sith Order was basically dead at that point. Um, because Darth Ruin was a Jedi Master, mind you, he went from Padawan to Knight to Master. He made it all the way up to the freaking Council. And he quit. That's why he's considered one of the 20 lost, or however lost the Jedi consider, because he made it to a Master position. He was an Umbaran, but he was so intelligent, powerful in the Force, that they rose him up to Master status, and I believe he made it to the Council. But he just decided, fuck it. I'm going to become a Sith Lord. And he became a Sith Lord, and he completely rounded up all the broken Sith clans in the galaxy, likely remnants, old rem remnants of Vichyat's empire, and remade the Sith Order. Of course, his philosophy was also a little bit too based in solipsisms, and he was noted to be insane and 
drove some of his apprentices and other Sith within his order insane, but he created the new Sith Empire. And the new Sith Empire was the foundation of an empire that actually had like Sith ideals integrated